Okay, John chapter 2, we want to look at, first we want to look at uh, the elements that make up John chapter 2 just in a practical way. We don't want any spiritualizing, we just want the facts. Who said that, Elliot Ness or something? <coughs> just the facts, ma'am. Uh, yeah, there you go. And um, so... At this stage, we're not looking for any spiritual truth, but we're looking, uh, and here's what, here's what we're going to look for going into this second chapter, verses 1 through 11. We have laid the foundation of spiritual truth in John chapter 1. We've done it from the beginning, and we've laid it all the way through to a physical manifestation. We already know that the Jesus that is described from now on in John is the Logos, the complete thought and concept of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the word word there is Logos, meaning not just in the beginning was some scriptures or whatever, but Jesus is the Word, and that means he is the complete thought and concept of God. That means that from now on in John, every story, and we will be covering stories, there's two in this, um, in this second chapter. We'll be covering different situations in which Jesus, the Logos, is in. And you will see how he is, if you take it from what we've taught so far, then that truth gives light and meaning to circumstantial things going on. In other words, We've spent this time developing a spiritual premise for all things. That before creation was, God had a plan, and that plan involved he and his son, the Logos, in relationship to him and us in him. And so, uh, uh, and then ultimately he and us. And so, all spiritual truth is going to come from the basis of that which was from the beginning, that which was before material substance. So when Jesus, the Word, the Word, the Logos was made flesh, we found in verse 14 of the first chapter, the Logos, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay. So you have your basic premise now for John. The Gospel of John will always put Jesus, not just as Jesus of Nazareth. Now you'll see if you look with these eyes and had you been there physically, you would have looked with these eyes and you would have seen Jesus of Nazareth. You would have set, seen a set of circumstances going on. You would have seen a miracle, and you would have said, wow, Jesus is a cool miracle worker. Cool. But that's not all that there is to be seen here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand where we're going from here? Life is not just a set of random things that happens. As far as from God's end, it is based on spiritual principle. It is all... Uh, orderly, just like when he created uh, creation. Uh, who was I talking to somebody? I guess it was Donald. I can't remember who I was talking to somebody. I said, I don't believe in the big bang theory of creation. Boom! Instant everything. I believe God started. First day he made this. Second day he made this. Third day. And each one added to the other until it culminated in the fullness of what he had in mind. I believe that's how God is. And I believe that that our understanding is to grow in John, but it doesn't grow. Have you ever known somebody that's been 50 years in the Lord and they still, don't, they just know the basic things and you go, why, how is that so? It is because they get in life here and they say, okay, there's a Jesus somewhere and they make that a linear reality. He's somewhere, it's like heaven is just another location other than where we can see, right? It could, it could just as well be Mars. Do you know what I'm saying? It's just another linear location, but it's not. It is a spiritual realm. And so, um, you know, God is somewhere in another location, and, uh, I, and he is going to help me because I have these material things that I have to face. And sometimes these material things bring me happiness, and, you know, and so I give God the glory for bringing me happiness by letting me have a puppy or something. You know what I'm saying? And, and sometimes I get upset with God or I get fearful because 
you know, a tiger walks in the room or something. And it's, it's all circumstantial. And so we go, huh, what do I do? What do I do? Confusion. Confusion is one of the biggest things because we don't, we don't understand the basic spiritual premise from which God works. And so life is confusing because circumstances always are changing. They never stay the same. And so it's, that's what's confusing because we, by the natural things, are trying to know the spiritual reality when in reality all you can know by his created thing is that uh, all you can know is what is it, the, scri the scriptures say, um, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork, shows he's a pretty good carpenter, a pretty good creator, but it doesn't show his heart. And I've used that example many times. You can have a carpenter who could maybe sculpt and, and do beautiful objects and look at that and go, wow, you know, but not know anything about what the guy's like inside. I mean, he might sit there and with clay sculpt a beautiful object and go home and beat his wife. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, he's got talent, but, you know, there may be other things. Well, I mean, yes, you can, you can see a lot about God and about God's ability by looking at the natural, but the, the spiritual things are not understood by looking at the natural, but rather by knowing that which is true in the spirit, it explains what's happening in the natural. And now I, I base this on something that I firmly believe, and I was uh, saying to somebody that... Uh, Somebody very dear to me that's in the ministry right now that I've always looked up to has kind of gotten off into a teaching that says, well, Jesus will not come back in those heavens there. I mean, he's going to come back in his heavens, but it ain't going to be these. It's going to be what we would term the spirit realm reality. Well, I believe any spiritual truth must manifest in the flesh. Jesus it was in the beginning with the Father, and eventually that Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That if it's true spiritually, it will eventually manifest in the natural. You get off into this spooky thing of, well, you know what I mean, well, it's all spiritual, everything's spiritual, and then you're no earthly good. And some people are legalistic, and everything is based on, oh, you held that too long, or you picked it up on Sunday, or whatever, you know what I mean? And it's all this, you know, oh, I'm afraid to... Uh, did I, when I spoke, did I, you know what I mean? I mean, you, can, you get all bound in that. Look, my heart's for God. I spoke. I messed up on some wording, but I didn't mean that, but I know that what my, what's in my heart, so I don't have to freak out. You know, the time to freak out is go, oh, I railed on you, and I meant it, and I realized it. You, you see what I'm saying? But we go, oh, did I, do you think, well, I don't know, did you? Well, I don't, you know. So, uh, the best way to understand everything is what we shared so far in John chapter 1. And I, I believe there's not any good way of really understanding John chapter 2 without understanding John chapter 1 because I believe God is a progressive God. So, from the beginning, which was before creation, which was before any element that's going to be mentioned in John chapter 2, there was a basic premise from which all things are understood. And all things came out from that basic premise, and all things will eventually return to that basic premise. Okay? So, life is not as confusing as we might think that it is, but it becomes confusing when you start trying to figure out all these different things and, you know, everything from a natural viewpoint. This is where we have to have the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that being said, I want to examine first John chapter 2 just based on the basic unspiritual elements that are there, and we want to list some of those on the board, and then... We want to take what we've learned and maybe what we know from other scriptures and we want to see what is the spiritual truth in relationship to Jesus here in uh, John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. Do you, do you understand basically where we're going there? We're going to talk, we're going to just list the basic physical elements there, but then we're going to try to understand those elements by spiritual truth that we already have. Okay? 
we're all going to do this together, so you don't have to feel afraid. Okay, somebody with just one of the basic elements that's talked about there. Leafa? Servants. Servants, okay. Somebody else? Huh? Water pots? Somebody else? Great. Wedding? We're, we probably won't deal with everything that's here, but we want to we want to just throw out a bunch. Uh, let's see. Bridegroom. Bridegroom. Are you already, if nothing else, just by listing these, are you already getting a feel for something? Ricky? Why? I figured you picked that. <laughs> wedding was the third day. Okay, Mallory? Water? Macy? Did you have your hand up? Okay, somebody else? Uh, yes, Mallory? Did what? Yes. Okay, so there's old wine and new and that's uh, once this was gone, there's a whole story relating to that, isn't there? Brian, did you have your hand up? Yes, mother. mother? Okay, good. Okay, well, that, that's enough just, just to get started. Now, there's obviously a lot more there, isn't there? Now, when we search the scriptures, we want to know the Lord. So the first thing to do... <coughs> And not necessarily first in order. I don't know if there's any specific order of listing and then going to the Holy Spirit or going to the Holy Spirit and listing. But certainly, as you look at a scripture, you, you, you don't just read it and go, what's the truth here? You know what I mean? Without any kind of trying to lay hold of anything, you just kind of go, teach me something. Oh, oh. no, 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 no. There are the, the clues are in the scriptures. The, like, shall I put it this way? The word is in the scriptures. Can we say it like that? The word is in the scriptures. Okay. So God gave us the scriptures. And, he gave, and, and I believe that no word of God is devoid of power. There's a scripture in Luke that the literal Greek translation translates it that way. No word of God is devoid of power. And uh, um, uh, the scripture says, Behold, in the, Jesus said this, Behold, in the volume of the book it is written of me. So that means what you're going to find here is that some people are going to make references to certain things based on scriptures that they know in other places. Okay? Scriptures that they know in other places. And because they know certain things from, maybe they knew a scripture first, then they learned a truth in relationship to that scripture way over here in Romans, all of a sudden they'll be reading along here and the Spirit of God will add that, will, will add that truth in here and show that that's tied in here and the Lord's trying to bring out something else, but that is part of the thing that's going to help you to understand it. Okay? So it's not, it's not just uh, doing something like um, studying the Greek. That helps. All of these things, what I, what I would do and what I've done time and time again is, you know, I may jump in the big middle of the thing uh, and, and search out every word in the Greek. Now, I've done that before. Every word, just to find out if there's any clues there. And I, I've done that a whole lot, actually. Um, I may not do that. I may get me, a, or I may do that with a few words. Then I may get me a Bible dictionary and look up water, water pots or, you know, and there it may say something that the water pots were not drinking vessels, they were vessels that were set at the front door for the guests that came, for in those days there were no paved roads and everyone wore sandals. And so their feet were all, have you ever walked like in dirt and you just it gets all the way up, you know what I mean? And they would come in and, and wipe their feet and cleanse their feet and come in and sit down. See, you go, cool. You know, I didn't know that. You know, that's adding one more element. That now that's not that's not revelation. That's Smith's Bible Dictionary or Unger's Bible. You know what I mean? That's not revelation. And I know some people that, that treat the Greek like revelation or treat 
Unger's Bible Dictionary, like Reve that's not revelation. Those are just the facts, okay? So here's the table of your heart. You're laying out the Greek facts. You're laying out the historical facts. You're laying out the word facts. You're laying out the storyline. You're laying out everything. You're not, you're, um, you're laying them out for several reasons. One is, I have found that as long as it's just a little story that you read there and kind of go like this, teach me what it means, you never get anything. Many times when you just lay things out like this, just lay them out, you see things better. It helps you to see things better. Okay? The other fact is, is you're laying them out because there's another person that's very important here to help you to understand what's going on, and that's the Holy Spirit. And so you're saying to the Holy Spirit, I cannot... You, you read that chapter and you say, I cannot understand this on my own. I can't see any depth here on my own. I, I need the veil rent. Only you can do that. Only you can really open my eyes. But there is something I can do. There's his part and there's your part. And I've, I've seen people where I've said this, you know, and you go through seasons where you emphasize certain things. You know, as a pastor, you emphasize certain things. But you can't emphasize everything, every sermon, can you? There's no way. So you go through this time period and you're emphasizing, search the scriptures, get in there, know the scriptures, know the scriptures, know the scriptures, get in there, study the scriptures. So everybody's going, okay, man, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, you know, how come I don't get nothing? I studied, and I studied hard, and I've been studying. Okay, so then Six months later, oh, only the Holy Spirit can show you. You need the Holy Spirit. So you go, oh, good, well, okay. And so you, then you sit back and you go, okay, show me, Holy Spirit. Show me. So then you sit around for six months going, well, I couldn't know it anyway without the Holy Spirit. Show me, Holy Spirit. Come on. You know? But you're not in the Scriptures. What you're doing is there's your part and there's his part. And you're going. Now, I can, I can read a Bible dictionary. I really don't think I'm going to be driving down the road without ever looking at a Bible dictionary and the Holy Spirit goes, Bong! Water pots! In the Old Testament! Oh, water pot! Was it? That ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. Your part is to pick up that book and say, Okay, service, water pots, wedding, bro, I think I need to check out these things that I can check, things that I can check out. So here I go. Check it out. And you go, okay. Now, for future reference, it would be good for me to write little things down that I remember or that seem important. So you get your little notebook. And you go, water pots and this and that. And, that, and you jot down little things like that. So you got it. And then you, you look up some of the Greek words, Hebrew words. I'll tell you what, man. There's some, some uh, portions of scriptures that's just like, I mean, like the book of Ruth. Uh, every name is significant. The way to understand the book of Ruth is to look up every name and then all of a sudden you go, Holy Spirit, teach me what this means. I don't have a clue. There's a whole bunch of names with different meanings and I don't know what it means. And then he'll bring it together. But he's not, you know, he's not going to do that apart from your part. So your part is the table of your heart, search the scriptures, search the Greek, Search the Bible diction. Do whatever part that you can. Having done all that you know to do, then you turn to the Holy Spirit and you go, okay, boss, your turn now. I did my part. This is the, my part up to this point. I've done all that I know to do, and I don't see nothing. Or sometimes even in the process of doing that, you see little things. Some of you might have even noticed some things as we wrote something down. Something kind of went, and you went, Hey, that's a trail I'd like to look at a little closer. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay? But we want to understand John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. We want to we want to know what God's heart is there. We want to know what God's truth is there. We don't want to just know the story that Jesus turns water into wine and wonder what the heck's he doing? Everybody's already drunk. Why is he feeding drunks? Wouldn't that be confusing? If you just looked at it in the literal sense, you go, my God, everybody's drunk, well drunk, said well drunk. And they're going, 
Hey, there's a bad wine first, man. I'll get that, you know. And, and well, thank Jesus. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know, but you know, we all jump off on all that, and we go, you know. And so somebody starts a doctrine. Jesus don't mind if you're drunk. In fact, if you get good and drunk, he wants you to go drink more. You know what I mean? Somebody starts a doctrine. So I will base it right here on this scripture. Uh, okay. What you're saying is scriptural, but it ain't Christ. And I know people that know the scriptures and say stuff, you know. Take a little wine for thine often infirmities. Well, I think they take a lot of wine for their often infirmities. You know, God gave us every seed-bearing herb. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I came out of that. I bore a lot of herb, you know. And, uh, <laughs> that's right. You know, I'm just getting closer to Jesus. Woo! <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, we got, you know, anything that, if, if you're going after your wants, your desires, you can come up with anything you want out of the Scripture. But if you want to know the heart of God, it's going to take, uh, what does the Scripture say? Um, that He will make him so well, I don't know the exact word he will make himself known to those who diligently seek him to those that diligently seek him okay now we can read the Bible till our eyeballs fall out on the page and not see him so there has to be something different than just well bless God I've been reading this thing for three weeks give me something there has to be a heart toward the Lord. You go here, you know, somebody argues with you and, you and you lost the battle and so you feel like an idiot and you're all embarrassed and everything. So you're going to get in the Word and learn this stuff, bless God, so you'll never be embarrassed again. Wrong motivation and good luck. You know, the Holy Spirit's going, oh yeah, I'd like to build up your ego and flesh by showing you a lot. You see what I mean? But we think, I, I, I remember a day when I thought that. I mean, I, I thought, oh, bless God, I felt like I got slapped around real good, you know? And that ain't ever going to happen to me. I'm going to know the Bible, you know? And God had to deal with me and say, hey, that's not what this is all about. When you become hungry to know my son and to be conformed to his image, I'll start showing you stuff. In the meantime, you're just, you're just establishing yourself more and more as a Pharisee. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you can go ahead and read it. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And of course... That's not talking about he gives prizes to those that are, you know. It means he rewards you by, because you're seeking him, he, you're rewarded by finding him. You know, he's the one that says, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. <coughs> okay, so what we're just trying to do here is lay out some basic things um, and then... Ask the Holy Spirit to help us, and I believe the Holy Spirit, and I've been praying in advance, praying in the Spirit, as, in, as well as in the understanding in advance for you, that we can begin to see things here. Okay, uh, you have contrasts, and you should be aware of the law of contrast. The law of contrast is a wonderful, wonderful teacher it will always be a friend to you. It will always be valuable to you if you understand the law of contrast. Um, <clears throat> there, are, there was darkness and void and confusion upon the earth, and God said, let there light, and the light divided from the darkness. And there was a contrast drawn between light and darkness. Um, there are things that are comparable, and there are things to be contrasted. Uh, in this case, I see uh, servants, so you have to see who else is involved here, and you go down, well, okay, you got, you got the mother. Okay, so you have servants, you have the mother, and with the mother was also the disciples, weren't they? 
The disciples were there. Okay? So, okay, so you start considering what, what was there. Okay, you got the multitudes, you got the mother and the brothers, you got the servants. All right. Each one of these play a specific role in relationship to Jesus. Right? They all stand in a certain relation, and you don't really know that relationship until you look at the scriptures. But they each stand in a certain relationship to Jesus and this situation. Okay? Then you have a contrast, which uh, uh, Molly pointed out, the contrast of the old wine and the new wine. It's a contrast, and, and the scriptures are trying to bring out this contrast between the old and the new. Okay? And you have to consider where the old was and where the new was in relationship to Jesus. You see what I'm saying? This is a, we're not really even spiritualizing here a lot. We're just saying, let's just look at it in the natural and if we, if we see the natural for what it is instead of as just some story that we don't see any contrast. We don't see any people in relationship to Jesus. We don't see different relationships with Jesus in relationship to this story. We just see people coming and going, people saying stuff, and when it's all over with, the people got wine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then what do you get out of the story? You get nothing. But if you start evaluating based on these things, okay, then you have water pots. See, let's see if this... Uh, helps identify these water pots a little bit more better. Okay, you have water pots. What is a water pot? It's a container. It's a vessel. It's a vessel. Or a vessel to contain. Okay? So what this does, you're, 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 first of all, you just identify, you know, water pot doesn't mean nothing. It's just a thing to us. You understand what I'm saying? It's just a thing. It's just an object. I mean, microphone stand. If you don't consider that in light of its of its function and its relationship to Jesus, and it's then you're not going to really understand its purpose. It's just your life is filled with a lot of things, and it's only important to you in relationship to what you need at the time. I need a vessel. But you're not thinking I need something that contains something. You're thinking I need a drink, and bless God, so it means nothing. But it means a whole lot. It is something that contains. It's called a vessel. Now, I said something earlier. There are other scriptures in the Bible. Can anybody think of another scripture that might help us to identify this right here? See? Okay, woman at the well, that's a, that is a good one. That's a, that happens to be another story, and sometimes, unless you've really seen that story, it's hard to bring that into another story. I'm just stating a fact here. Sometimes, But there are other scriptures, like in uh, the epistles and whatever, that will bring out things that aren't a particular story that will help bring an identification. Somebody else? Vessel? Roger? Okay, yeah. Yeah, there, and there are scriptural references to that. Okay, I, I see several hands, but I'm looking for more hands. Mike? Okay, anybody ever heard that scripture before? Did anybody think of that before I called on Mike? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, that is the Holy Spirit's job, to bring to remembrance the scriptures. One of the reasons, one of the reasons why you regularly read the scriptures isn't so that every time you read the scriptures you get something. I know that you think that's the case, but that is not the case. And many of you become disappointed because you'll read scriptures and not get anything. One of the reasons to regularly read the scripture is just to refresh your mind of the scripture so that when the time comes, because uh, I, I asked for a, a show of hands of how many of you thought of that scripture 
before I called on Mike and I had maybe a third of the class. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the scripture, but we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that scripture before. Okay, so, one, so many of us have heard that scripture. The advantage of just reading the scriptures, just reading and reading regularly is that you're giving ground to the Holy Spirit to be able to quicken things to you that, because if you've forgotten it, it's harder to call it to your remembrance, okay? So, so don't, I repeat, don't always go to the scriptures thinking I must get something, okay? Go to the scriptures wanting to know the Lord, but willing to read and, and having read five chapters, time's up, you've got to go do whatever and, and leave and you don't have any more time to read, that you can feel content. I read five chapters and I'm refreshing myself in the scriptures on, on a regular basis. That's called maintenance, you know? It's, it's like changing the oil in a car, not that I'm not good at doing that in my cars, but it's still a good idea. Good old-fashioned maintenance is keeping things up to par. Uh, and it, it's not really even, you're not supercharging your car when you put oil in it, you're just maintaining it. And some of you have a supercharged mentality. You don't change the oil, but you go buy a big old carburetor with a big chrome breather on it, you know, and boom, run, 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 and you blow the engine, you know what I mean? I know what that's like. So, except for I don't have a big chrome thing on it. <laughs> but some of you think in terms of you got to have something big and shiny from the Word of God, and I'm saying that you need to register this in you. A regular just reading of the Scriptures is good. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think both are true. That's good, that's a good observation because uh, you know the, you know what most people would do with that they take it one way or the other. Human nature. It's either we're going to fulfill every scripture because we're going to understand all scripture. Now, just good luck for you to understand all scripture. Okay, but that's what we think. Or we're going to go the other way and just naturally fulfill it. Well, I think both are true. I think, I think what you said is right. I think there are times that Jesus, who being who he is, does naturally fulfill the scriptures. But on other times, I think there were things that he wanted to bring out. He was the natural fulfillment, but that wasn't good enough for him. He wanted it understood for their sake. So he would bring that out, you know. And you don't know how hard that was for Jesus to have to bring that out he would rather somebody else walk up and go, did you see that? He fulfilled the scripture. But he'd have to say, thus to fulfill the scripture, let us, do. you know what I mean? And, but nonetheless, he did that for their sake so that they would understand. Or something that was a little more clear that might hit here, that the Holy Spirit later on, and sure enough, later on it says, later the Holy Spirit showed them what these things meant. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And you know, Jesus did know the scriptures. Jesus, Jesus quoted the scriptures quite often. Jesus, you know, you go, what? You, you fulfill it all. What's the, you know? And, um, you know, we've been over that, and we'll really get over that in chapter 5 someday. But, uh... Man, I'm telling you, it's important. I just think it's important to know the scriptures, but I don't, I'm not, I don't, I think if you try to just know the scriptures in, uh, in an academic way without realizing, I'm learning this with the hope and desire that the Holy Spirit will open my eyes, then you can become, you have the potential of becoming a Pharisee. On the other hand, if you just read the scriptures every once in a while and go, kind of go spookily, you know, Holy Spirit. Oh, me something, you know. Then you're not, you're not in a very, I think you can in a very practical, real way go, you know, I read 
uh, the second psalm today and studied it. I think I know in the literal meaning what it means a lot better than I did before I read it. There's nothing wrong with that. But then you're always saying, now I need the Holy Spirit to bring it to life. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's, I think there's a certain element of truth there. I just do. I, I do think that there are people that take that thing too far, though, and they go, you know, like David said, uh, uh, I love thy word, you know, and I search it, I love thy law, and I want to behold wondrous things out of thy law. You know, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Well, if you just can read it and do what it says and why open his eyes you know so so I you know we just have this tendency to go one way too far or the other and yeah. so, so some go well God just have to open my eyes and that's where what Kevin said is right I mean there's some things that you know you can just do you know you know pray one for another well and God opens my eyes you know, we'll love one another. Well, right now, I just hate everybody, but when God opens my, you know. <laughs> okay, so you've read it. We've brought out a few elements of it. <clears throat> Let's see if anybody has seen anything in relationship to John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Anybody have anything they felt like or they either seen before or this time in relationship to spiritual reality that's brought out in these verses? Anybody? Sure? Yeah. Okay. And the spiritual significance? So, you, so you've seen the application of the logos, the water, the word, the complete thought and concept of God being poured in, and then life coming out as a result of that. So that it's, you know, so that it's, I guess, by saying the vessels, you're saying Christ in you. Okay. Does that sound anything like what we talked about in chapter one? Anybody else have anything, anything significant? Okay. I mean, you, you see the literal thing going on there, but that's not the literal. That's seeing beyond that. That's seeing into the heart of God. Uh-huh. Let me comment on the, uh, the, the, the good wine last. Um, John in the first chapter said, that which was before me has come after me. Remember that? Remember? He was before, but he's come after. That which is natural is first, then that which is spiritual, and that's a whole teaching right there in itself. But that which was true before it manifested down here has always been and so so he's going okay well first there's as far as we were concerned we were born we started into this earth and then at a certain juncture we met the lord right and so we go oh boy you know i mean this thing started out pretty bad but it's really gotten a lot better since i met the lord well 
you know, I mean, I'm not going to go into the fullness of the, the spiritual truth there, but you, you, this is where you get the old covenant and then the new covenant. A lot of different things there, old and new, just the significance of the old and the new will bring out the old man, the new man, old covenant, new covenant. You see what I mean? And you, you begin to delve into scriptures that bring things out like that and say, Holy Spirit, is what is this significant of? Old and new. Is this Old and New Testament? Is this uh, Old and New Covenant? Is this Old and New, old, the Old Man, the New Man? What is, you see, only he can really, you, you, you don't just go, oh, well, that must be, you see what I'm saying? You've you got to have him teach you, but you're holding things before him. You're not just kind of going, you're like some sort of zombie that goes, well, I couldn't learn nothing. Just show me, Lord. You know, and you're like this blank page, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no, no. You have a will. You have a mind. You have an emotion. You have these things, and you're you're involved with the Lord. You're going. I don't. You know. Hey, Father. You know. I don't know. Uh, what do you think? You know. Da, 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 I was thinking about this and that. It wouldn't we call that kind of a relationship? You know. But if you just kind of walk around going, Why don't God show me nothing? You know, and he's like, you know, your father's standing there and you walk up to him and you go. You stand there for 30 minutes, an hour. And you walk off and go, he didn't show me nothing. You know, well, he don't know. Maybe he, maybe he thought you were thinking about something or, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> right? Right. And that zombie thing, I just, I just want to say this, it's very, very dangerous because the enemy, Satan works in ground that is just this passive, well, I don't know, you know, that's why he loves confusion so much because confusion wears you out. Have you ever noticed that? And then you, you just want to, you, you don't want to do anything, you're tired, you're worn out, you just, and you just kind of, you know, and he can really come in there on top of that. That's when you get depressed, that's when you get down. Those, he starts bringing in thoughts and feelings and junk. Stay active. Use your mind. It's not by your mind. Your mind is part of your soul. But use your mind. He gave you a mind. Use your will. Use your, you know, don't be afraid of emotions, but don't let them govern you. But I, I mean, you know, since my spirit can receive from the Lord, but only my mind can ask questions, I trust the Holy Spirit to help me even to know, like, to, to go, huh, Old and new. I wonder what that's a reference to. You know, there's a lot of possibilities here. You see what I mean? And then you start thinking about it. But you're thinking, it's kind of like you've got the Lord's arm right here in your arm, and you're thinking about it here, and you're, you're in connection with him, and you're about to ask him all these things, but you want to kind of mull them up to a point of being able to go, what do you think? What's the deal here? I mean, a lot of times when I've sat in services where people are teaching, I'll be kind of doing that right there with the Holy Spirit going, you know, I, when I hear things that I don't understand, you know, a lot of times we think if we hear something we don't understand, it couldn't be right, which would mean that we understand all things, you know, there's nothing that, that could possibly be true that we wouldn't understand, you know, which is not the case, and that's the way I used to think, you know, well, if it's something I didn't understand, I go, ah, you know. You're trying to pervert me. I used to think that way because I was I so wanted to be right with God. I was afraid people, you know. But I learned I don't have to be so fearful all the time. God is my Father. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. Jesus is my Lord. Uh, I'm not I'm not just open to anything. Well, I'll just believe anything. Tell me whatever you want. That's not what I'm saying. On the other hand, I'm saying, you know, is there a, Lord? You know that don't sound right to me. 
but I don't know everything. Is there a possibility that that could be right? Or is there a possibility that something that he's saying is wrong and my spirit is bearing witness to something that he's saying, but there's a part of it that is right and I don't want to throw it all out. I'd like to be open to what is right. I can even grow by somebody that's basically wrong. Help me. You see what I'm saying? And that's true. You can because you're over here. Good grief. You got your father. You got the Holy Spirit. Jesus is your Lord. You know, I mean, try to get through, sucker. You know what I mean? I mean, but, but we don't look at it like that. We look at it like it's us and there's, we're surrounded by 80 million demons and we're in the world and oh, oh my God. And, and he said something wrong. I ain't listening to him ever again. You know? And so the only person you'll ever be able to receive from is somebody that is totally right all the time. And good luck finding that person. When you find them, tell me. In fact, I think we've already found him. His name's Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's right every time. I remember learning things when I was a, a young believer. And, you know, I would take some scripture and go, Oh, I saw, you know, and I think I did see some things there. But I'd look back later, I remember reading some of the stuff I wrote down and going, yeah. <laughs> you know. And, uh, but I remember going, oh, this is the Lord and, you know, whatever. Well, it proves to me that I can even be wrong and the Holy Spirit will still show me what's right if I stay open and I trust him. And I do trust him. I, look, I don't, you know, you don't trust me. I wouldn't trust me. I don't trust me. Why would you? You know what I mean? I don't trust me. I don't lean to me. Why would you? Are you, are you that big of a dummy? I know me. Really, seriously, I don't trust. But I trust the Lord. And I trust Him supremely. And He will keep you. That which He began, He will complete. Who began it? Oh, I did. I accepted Jesus and I grabbed hold of him and I'm holding on real tight now, but I think I'm slipping. No, no, no. You didn't save yourself. You didn't call yourself. You couldn't have come to God except God drew you. That which he begun, he will complete. If you really believe that, it'll just take a big load off of you. You know, trying to, ah, oh, you just go, man, I am a mess. I, there is no hope for me, totally none except for him, and I believe in him. I better believe in him because I truly believe there's no hope in me. You see what I'm saying? But if you if you still got hope in you, you're still going, oh, oh, you know, and then you mess up and you go, oh, I failed God. I failed, <laughs> I failed God. He's sitting up there going, I knew you were going to fail me, you know, because you're not perfect. You don't know me fully yet. That's what I'm trying to bring you into. Yeah, you failed me. Get up and quit whining. How many people like their kid to come in and go, I messed up, <laughs> you know, and walk around for a, a week, you know, just going, you know, and every time you walk by, you know, your parents, you go, oh, I can't, I can't come to the dinner table and all this junk. You know what I mean? You're going, oh, I'm so proud of you. You know, that don't happen. Am I getting a little carried away? I'm looking at your faces. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are going, it's time to go to Europe, Randy. <laughs> but, you know, we, it, somehow we think that pleases our Father, and that does not please our Father. Come in, say, man, I blew it. I really blew it. And I know I blew it, and I'm not proud of it, but I tell you what, I'm not going to sit here and grovel in this stuff. Teach me everything you want to teach me out of it, but here I am, I'm your son. And if he goes, then start acting that way. <laughs> but if he does what his word says, what his word says, come boldly and get the grace that you need when you, when you need it. You don't need grace if you did everything right. You need grace when you do it wrong. He said, come boldly. I need grace, Father. I'm the right one to come to because I've got it. I'm full of Jesus is full of grace and truth. You've come to the right place. Here's the 
the, the depository of grace. There is no other flow. The fountain of all grace, unmerited favor is right here. How much do you need? I was telling somebody the other day that the scriptures say that he has given us super abundant grace. So, I mean, that, that's the literal Greek. The uh, literal Greek is super abundant. And I looked it up and it means this. It means that he has supplied grace beyond all that need would ever have. It is beyond all need, not just yours, all above all that could ever be, it is above that. Okay, so there's all the yuck of all lives, of all lifetimes, of all generations is this much. Well, he supplied even that much more. And you go, I mean, if you see that, now you have to see that. But if you see that, you go, Man, I'd be stupid. You know, Paul said that. I am not going to make void the grace of God. I mean, when you see it, you don't make it void. The only time you make it void is when you don't see it. Because you think there's not enough. <laughs> I've been in here seven times this week. Go ahead, just kill me. Just kill me, God. Just kill me, I know. I keep failing you. You know, and I know there's probably, you know, it's like a tube of toothpaste. You shrivel that thing up to the very end, and I'm, there's probably just a little bit left, not even enough to brush my teeth with. <laughs> just kill me. And, and imagine all this abundance. And he's going, what are you talking about? And you don't even listen to him. You're too busy going, ah, you know, and ranting and raving, carrying on. He's just going, man, you know, he would like to say something like this to you. Wake up! Arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Well, I don't feel like it. Stop going by your feelings. <laughs> Stop going by your feelings. Stop going by things that are contra cast down. Anything, feelings, thoughts, sermons, anything that is contrary to the Word of God. Okay? All right, so now we're ready to talk about chapter 2, but we've got to take a break. So let's take a five-minute break, I guess, and we'll come back and...